Hi, I'm Kate Bornstein. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Kate Bornstein, welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. How are you today? That's the craziest question these days, isn't it? Right. Um, how am I? I'm healthy. Good. I'm safe. I'm in America, so anything could happen. You know, uh, fortunately, it's not happening in my neighborhood. So I'm OK. Thank you. How are you? Really good. Thanks. And I'm really excited to talk about you and your amazing career. To get us started, can you tell me when you were a kid, what did you aspire to be growing up? What did you imagine you'd be doing as an adult for a job? I thought I'd be a doctor. My father really? was a doctor and it wasn't that I wanted to be a doctor. Mm. Uh, it was that it was expected of me. And so I guessed, okay, here I go. And I was headed toward medical school. And it wasn't until high school I started to write. Um, and then I really got into writing yeah. and, and acting. And I wanted to be an actor. That's, and from high school on, I wanted to be an actor. Fantastic. You're, you're in England, yeah? I am, yes. What's the equivalent of high school? Secondary school. That, that's when I decided I'd be an actor. <laughs> Amazing. And so you've had such a fascinating life. I'll just touch on it briefly, but so you, and I think it was 1970, you joined the Church of Scientology. Um, how did you end up there? What sort of initially attracted you to it? How did you hear about it? I was on a, on a break uh, I finished my first year of graduate school mm. as an actor and I was taking a break and I was driving across country uh, looking for the answer to the world's problems. Right. I, was a, I was a hippie boy and I had all kinds of healthy food with me. I had sprouts and I had grains and I had rice and everything and I was cooking on a little camp stove for myself and... I finally ended up in Denver, Colorado, which is right in the middle of the country. And I wanted to buy a new pair of boots. And next door to the boot place was Scientology. They were open. And there was a sign in the window that said, abandon your tedious search. The answers have been found. Convenient. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then I had a big crush on the, the, the young woman who was at the reception desk. And so the rest was, and they were eating pizza, uh, which I got all excited about. So I it's figured, okay, helps. right. You can be enlightened and have pizza. Yeah. That was, that was it. <laughs> be enlightened, but become happier. There you go. <laughs> So you were with Scientology, I think, for 11 or 12 years. You got very high up. You worked with L1 Hubbard. Was it when you finally left there that you felt you could first sort of be and live as your authentic self? Not right away. Hmm. Not right away. I, I, was, I was a lost soul. Um, I, I got into acting yeah. and I got into a lot of cocaine, right? It was the 80s. And so cocaine was everywhere. Uh and drinking, um, and I got married for the third time. Uh, and then I realized, you know what? None of this is working. Being a man still isn't working because all my life, you know, you try. You, I, I did. I try. Okay, I'm going to make this work. This is this is the hand I was dealt. I'm going to make it work. And finally, then it was like in. 84, 1983 or 84, um, I got divorced from my third wife, uh, got in Alcoholics Anonymous, and started moving toward, I don't call it my authentic self, I started moving toward, I, I, I thought that I was living man, and I thought I was going to be a woman. Um, those are the words I was using. Yeah, of course, yeah. So 
authentic self that i have problems with that phrase i don't understand that that okay it kind of depends where you're at and everyone is different and this is the the wonderful thing about words anyway people have their own words that sort of make sense to their journey but it doesn't necessarily reflect someone else if you are at a place where you were sort of thinking you wanted to transition or you know you didn't identify with necessarily where you were at that point so that's kind of what I mean by that does that make sense yeah oh yeah I I understand that it's a term that's used for that yeah. um I'll just have to work it around in my head I've been working with with different ideas of gender <laughs> and and I'm seeing more that gender is made up of three factors. I'm right. seeing gender. Gender is made up of body, first and foremost, um, and mind, and time, space-time. Yep. Okay. So given those three things making up gender, we can call it whatever we want. So uh, if I can perhaps rephrase it, let's have a go. Okay. Did you find a more comfortable expression of yourself when you left Scientology? Oh, thank you. After, after I got off of cocaine, I did. <laughs> I was not comfortable with myself while right. I was on coke. I'll try and avoid I, that then. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so I haven't done any since, since then. So. Right. There goes my next question. So you started writing for the Bay Area Reporter in San Francisco. It's the longest running LGBTQ newspaper, I believe, in America, which is amazing. And it's still running today as well. Yep. And so did you start learning more people in the community and stuff like that? And it was a completely different environment to what you've been surrounded by for the last 11 or 12 years? Oh, yeah. Getting into... Hmm. I was in Philadelphia before I was in San Francisco, and I came out into the gay and lesbian AA meetings. That's where I first came out, um, and they were very welcoming of me. And then I came out into the lesbian community in Philadelphia, and they were not so welcoming of me. But eventually... Uh, I, I made some friends there, started up a theater group. Uh, we called it Order Before Midnight. And we produced a couple of plays. And then the woman I was seeing moved to San Francisco. She broke my heart, moved to San Francisco. And I figured, fuck it, I'll go to San Francisco too. And I went out after her, chasing her. And that was like 1988. Mm -hmm. And the size of the gay and lesbian community in San Francisco. I got there in June, right before Pride, and Pride was enormous. It, just, it filled the streets and drag queens forever, the most beautiful drag queens you could imagine. And I said, I'm home. Okay, <laughs> here we go. And that's when I started writing for the Bay Area Reporter. Um, I was an arts writer. I reviewed movies and books and spoke with people like that. Fantastic. That's what I started doing too. I was reviewing movies. I gravitated towards entertainment at a very early age and I studied it in college and university. And here we are. So yeah, I, I can yeah. relate to that. <laughs> So in 1994, you released your first book, Gender Outlaw. What was the reaction to that at the time? Obviously, it was pre-internet or anything like that. So how did people respond to the book when it first came out? It was pre-internet, but there was still an online presence. Um, True. There were companies called like America Online. There mm. was CompuServe. You could sign on. And they had a proprietary bubble on the internet. So you could, you could chat with people. But... <laughs> There weren't websites. Yeah. There's no such thing as that. Uh, so you could look up some information, but it was it was quite limited to the server you had signed up for. Um, the reason I'm saying that is because in the first edition of the book, I put in my email address. Oh, I figured, wow. I figured man, nobody's going to be reading this. Hmm. And <laughs> oh, my God. I got so many proposals of marriage. 
Yeah. Yeah. And threats from white supremacists. I don't know what they were doing reading my book, but (laughs) (laughs) the book was not well received in the trans community. And remember, this is the first edition of the book. And I've since come out with a second edition. And I've, I've figured out why it was not such a good, why it didn't go over very well with trans women. Um, I was very much anti-binary at the time. We didn't call it that. I, there, there were no real words for it. I was flailing around for words. Mm. Um, but basically, I was saying, There were men and women, but they were only pretend. And, and, it, and it's much better. In, all right, I'll use the words today. It's much better to be non-binary. And I set up a binary of binary and non-binary. Right. And I was going rah, rah, non-binary. And, well, this is false. And, I w- of course, people over here would get angry with me. So I've, I've fixed that in, in, in the second edition. And I haven't had too many people who've read the second edition get angry with me. Well, I loved it. Uh, yeah, as you say, you, you went back and you've revised and rewrited things as language flows and changes throughout the years, as you sort of acknowledge. I have the audio book of it, by the way, and it's so much fun. And I love the way you tell the story and everything like that. And I highly recommend it. Speaking of which, I found out that it's called Gender is a Woolly Worm in China, which I love. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we couldn't call it Gender Outlaw in China because the translation was like sex criminal, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and couldn't have a book called that. Right. We were trying to figure out all kinds of things. And I said, well, gender maybe is a butterfly. No, no, that's that's for children. And then. Well, gender is a caterpillar, you know. No, no. Well, yeah, yeah, we could we could do that. And only they use the children's term for it, which is woolly worm. Right. Yeah. So was that the only region where you had to change the, the title of the book? Or are there lots of different versions of it out there? No, that was the reason. That was pretty much the only place that the title of Gender Outlaw has changed yeah. is in China. So in 1998, you released my gender workbook and how people find and explore what their gender is. Can you tell us a bit about that for anyone that hasn't read it yet? So when I wrote Gender Outlaw, it was a lot of outpouring of my expression. And and I, I made the point that when looking at gender, questions are more important than answers. And so... For a second book, I wanted it to be all the questions, all the questions you could possibly ask yourself about gender. Uh, And not that you'd find answers, but it would open doors just by asking the questions. And that's the kind of book I wrote. That's also updated into a second edition called My New Gender Workbook. And I'm, I'm very happy with that one. Yeah, I love that you do that and you go back and revise your work as well, which I, I think is amazing. Oh, believe me, it's kind of like that's that's a blessing as an author. My biggest fear was I'd write something really stupid and it, it would be out there for all time. And it turns out with Gender Outlaw, I did. And, and I was blessed. I was blessed with with the opportunity to do a a second edition on those books. The big fix with the second edition of the workbook was when the workbook came out, the idea of intersectional politics, intersectional activism, intersectional existence wasn't really on the table. It wasn't being discussed. Mm. Um, But when I went back into it and did my second edition, I had a chance to incorporate intersectional theory as well. That was, that was exciting for me. Even if you have the original copies of the books when they first came out, please go and get the new editions as well. It's fun. There's pirates in the new edition. Pirates. Pirates. Pirates are always good. And um, there's movie watching. 
you, you get to go watch Wally. Oh, fantastic! The Disney Pixar movie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole thing in in Wall. Did you you've seen Wally? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, and you have a male robot and a female robot, right? Yep. How do you know that? We assume that Wally is a male and the other robot is a female. Mm. And how they do that is really interesting. Mm. And I take that apart in, in the gender workbook. After that, you released Hello, Cruel World, 101 Alternatives to Suicide. The, the trans community sadly has still a horribly high suicide rate. If you've got any advice for anyone that's not feeling okay at the moment, how can they pull themselves out of that? Yeah, that's that's a big issue in our community, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, we grow up, most of us, having to lie about who we are, having we're forced into some being something we know we're not, and that's a that's a trauma. We grow up traumatized and. Too many of us, I, I considered suicide at least six times in my life that I remember and attempted a couple of times. Um, my advice, the, 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 the book is not a suicide prevention book. It's a book of alternatives. It's a book of things to do instead of killing yourself. And it's, it's fun. It's a fun book and it's also serious. But if you don't have it or if you can't get it, um, here's the basis of the book. You asked if there was something I wanted to say. I would say you do whatever it takes to make your life more worth living. It'll never be completely worth living. Nobody's life is. There's always a problem. There's always something that, well, I got to fix that. But you can always make it more worth living, no matter your circumstances. So you do whatever it takes. It doesn't matter. You do any do it illegal, immoral, uh, fattening, whatever. Um, do it. There's only one rule that in the book, there's only one rule that makes that kind of blanket permission possible. And I was really proud. There's no fucking rules in the book, not even the golden rule. One of the, one of the alternatives is break the golden rule. Fuck it, everybody else does. Um, but the, the rule that is there is don't be mean. You could it's do anything your heart desires. Just don't be mean mean that's the bad thing you should be able to make your life more worth living you should be able to go on living that way i love the fact that the book exists and inspires you to find find joy in your life which i think is really important and to focus on that more which um, hopefully more people can do thank you miss sarah thank you i'm certain i've been there myself and Sometimes it feels impossible, but you can get past it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're both here. Exactly. In 2012, you were diagnosed with lung cancer and you went through chemotherapy and radiation and all that kind of stuff. How are you feeling now several years afterwards? I'm, I'm coming up on 70, 73 years old and um, I've slowed down a lot. Uh, that's one thing it does to you. And... Um, but I am healthy. Um, I'm keeping away from COVID uh, because I'm a high risk at, at death from COVID should I get it because of the cancer. Um, but I'm cancer free these days. Uh, I fought it, I won. Um, I'm so glad fun. that you did and that you're still here and an incredible story that you've been through. Then you released a memoir. Was that at the same time? It was right before I was diagnosed. I was on a book tour, right. um, releasing the memoir, doing readings from it, and, and, and just getting sicker and sicker. I didn't know what it was. And I was also, like, there was a film crew going around with me, Sam Fader. Yes, I love who, him. Who, yeah, 
who made the the amazing documentary Disclosure um, about trans presence in 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 cinema. It, it, it's brilliant. Um, well, he before he made that, he made a film um, a documentary about me um, and. When I got back from that tour, I saw my doctor, and that's when they diagnosed the lung cancer. How did the collaboration come about with Sam? He called me. And oh, said really? he wanted, yeah. Just got yeah. it from your book, maybe. <laughs> yeah. It was sweet. I spoke to Sam when the disclosure came out. We had a great conversation about it. I bet. Yeah. He's a good guy, one of the very good guys. Mm. And it's such an important documentary too. As you say, it speaks about trans representation in the media for the last 50 or so years. And hopefully it opens a lot of people's eyes and minds as to how people are being portrayed and how we can be better portrayed in the future. Yeah, yeah. In 2016, you became a cast member on I Am Kate. How did that come about? (laughs) Uh... Through Jen Richards. Jen Richards and I were friends. Jen Richards is another filmmaker and actor uh, in Hollywood. And Jen had been on the show in season one Mm. and said, oh, you should get Kate. You should get Kate. And so I was invited. I did a couple of episodes in season one. And I was apparent. I was very good at getting Caitlyn Jenner out of her comfort zone. And so they brought me in for season two to do more of that. I would ask questions like, you know, how do you deal with being called a freak? And she'd go, what, what, what? And um, There were some really important conversations on that show and lots of different views and obviously experiences. The entire community doesn't share the same life or views or anything. And I think one great thing that show did is show that we are all different yeah we we were trans women we were showgirls we were non-binary we were women no trans on it we 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 were we were all different and it was beautiful spending that kind of condensed time it was like three months on a bus (laughs) on the road uh, with these women. And, and as you say, we, we had different experiences, different language. Mm. Um, I won't get into that. <laughs> Are you still in contact with Caitlin and the rest of the cast members? Yep. Very, not, not on a full-time basis, but yeah. Yeah. Jenny Boylan and I are still very, very close. We're on the same, we're, we're on Eastern United States. And so it's easier for us to stay in touch. Most all the rest of the cast is on the West Coast. And that's a big divide. I'm quite nocturnal. So my sleeping pattern's kind of set to the West Coast in America, which is only a problem when I have to speak to people in England and I'm asleep when they're awake. <laughs> <laughs> have you got any messages for the community? Get visible on your own time. Um, I spent a lot of my life invisible. And it was necessary. It just was. Uh, And unfortunately, visibility personal on a personal basis um, can get you killed in today's climate. Uh, be safe please my darling stay alive that's that's the big ticket and be bold and beautiful and great where you can whenever you can and push the envelope absolutely but but safety first please so in 2017 you made your feature film debut in saturday church was that fun to do? I love that movie. Thank you. That was a great deal of fun. And, and the character was delicious playing the church lady. Yeah. 
So that that was great, and and meeting all the young trans actors who later went on to um, appear in Pose. They did, yes. Yeah. I saw Pose first, and then I went back and watched that, and I was like, oh wow! So people should, if they love Pose, go check it out. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to speak about a film I haven't seen yet, which is Two Eyes, which is a fascinating movie, it sounds like, set in three different time periods. In, I think, the 19th century, the 1970s, and then modern day, and you play a therapist in the movie? I do. I, I The director of an LGBTQ center in the middle of Wyoming, which is mm-hmm. one of those places I would caution you to come out in. <laughs> Um, wonderful like, film, Two Eyes, if you yeah. get a chance when it does come out. The cinematography looks beautiful, by the way. It looks really gorgeous. Oh, yeah. It's a gorgeous film. Yeah, yeah. I was also instantly delighted to see you in two episodes of The Blacklist recently, <laughs> uh, with James Spader. Yeah. Um, and he actually hugged me and kissed me. Uh, I was kissed by James Spader. Ta-da! <laughs> Uh, that was delightful, playing a kooky character um, in that uh, that series, which I I don't know. I, I don't know if I can release this news. Yeah, I, have yeah. new, I have news. I have news. It looks like it's going to go on for another season. It Amazing. looks like it. It's one of my favorite shows. Blacklist, James Spader is one of my favorite actors. I love the characters he plays. And he's a total gentleman on the set. Lovely human being. You have this fascinating looking magnifying glass on the show that has lights inside and glows. <laughs> Did you yes. get to keep that at all? No, no, unfortunately. It was, it's, I play um, an antique dealer who can mm. tell how much stuff is worth and use that to, to look very closely at stuff. So they need to keep hold of that when you return, obviously. Can you tell me what you're working on next? Is there going to be another book? Are you thinking about stuff you might be working on later in the year? Uh, I'm really proud and pleased to be a cast member of an audio book that's out on audible.com right now. Um, it's a play. Uh, the play was due to open this past summer and, of course, couldn't. And so the producers said, well, the play's got to be out there somewhere. And they struck a deal with Audible. And it's a play by um, trans woman Shakina Nafak uh, called the Chunbury International Hotel and Butterfly Club. And it takes place at the hotel where a group of women, 12 or 13 women, are getting their trans surgeries. And there's all these trans women in the cast. And it's available now on, on Audible. Please do get it. It's, it's a lovely piece of theater. The Chunbury International Hotel and Butterfly Club. Um, I can tell you now, there is an, aud- a, a, an audio book of my memoir, A Queer and Pleasant Danger. Mm. Um, I had wanted to do the, the narration myself, but I was in the middle of chemotherapy and radiation and I really couldn't. The good news is that I will be recording um, I'm so excited, an audio book of, of my memoir, Queer and Pleasant Danger, and, and it'll be released, I guess, a few months thereafter. So that's Fantastic. going on. And I'm doing online gigs. I used to go around, do a lot of touring and speaking at colleges and universities, and that's not possible these days. Mm. But here you and I are, and I'm able to perform, I'm able to, to give talks, I'm able to, to have conversations with lovely people like yourself, and I'm doing more and more of that kind of thing. And I, um, If you want me to appear at your college or group or something like that, you can tweet me at, at Kate Bornstein on Twitter. That's the best way to do it. 
<laughs> or you can write me via my website. And so I wouldn't normally say this on my show, but as it happened, I stayed at the Chombury International Hotel in Stop 2017. It. Really? That's so cool. For a month. You, you know they've had to close it because of COVID. I loved it there. A piece of, I know, it was a piece of trans history. Yeah, just a bit. So you're a Butterfly Club member. Yep. Oh. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I loved it there. They're amazing. There's a lot of monkeys everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a few days before the reason why I was there happened, I went to a local zoo and it was like a, an open zoo, but I also just have monkeys just running around everywhere. It was, it was amazing. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. It's an amazing place and I hope to you know, go back to Chumbri one day and visit the people that I'm still in contact with. And, yeah. It's all right. Anybody who's watching this, look at how warm uh, the memory is for Sarah. Creating those memories is what the play is about. Yeah. Well, I've got even more reason to check it out now. Because, yeah. Yeah. Because I've been there. I was like, hang on, I've, I've been to that hotel. <laughs> I lived in that hotel for a month. As you mentioned, you've done lots of one-person shows and performances, and you even toured the UK in 2016. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. And uh, played very near the West End. What I'm trying to do now is I've got like three or four plays that I want to adapt into graphic novels. And I'm looking around for artists to work with on that project. So that's something I'm working on as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, right? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to see those. That'd be amazing. That would be fun. So are you revisiting things you did perhaps even decades ago and bringing them back to life? Yep. Oh, that's fantastic. Yep. I'm, I've got one play called Strangers in Paradox about a pair of lesbian serial killers. <laughs> one question that I ask all of my guests is, can you tell me a fun fact about you? Something we may not know. It can be a hobby, a party trick, something like that. I've never had the chance to get into manga or anime. But I am right now in the middle of reading Hunter x Hunter. And I'm on volume six. And I want to be every one of the characters in this, this story. I am having so much fun with manga uh, right now. That's, that's my big thing. You're an amazing author. Have you got any tips for aspiring writers or how people can perhaps get their work published? Publishing world today is so different now, again, because of COVID. Mm. The big thing is write every day even when you don't feel like writing, uh, at least 20 minutes a day, you can do it. You really can do it. Um, that's, that's the biggest tip. You've had an, an incredible career and you've worked on loads of amazing shows and you've written lots of books and traveled a lot as well. Obviously, you've got loads more to see too, but how do you want to be remembered by the community and just the world at large? What do you want your legacy to be? She was a good auntie to all of the trans folk and queer folk. That's how I would like to be remembered. The best. Thank you. Finally, have you got any messages to people watching the Sarah O'Connell show and your fans around the world? Oh... Okay, yeah, I do. I, I realize there are people who are fans and, and really admire my work and admire me. And that's hard to accept. You know, that's, ah, um, I don't know. But let me say to you, thank you. Thank you for, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving my work. But I can only accept it on this basis. The only reason you love my work, the only reason you admire me is that you possess the same qualities yourself. You wouldn't recognize them unless you did. So there's a whole lot to say. There's an old saying, it takes one to know one. So Thank you for admiring me. That means fully that I admire you. Well, That's how 
works. Kate Bornstein, thank you so much for your time today. It's been an honor chatting to you. You are such a lovely hostess, dear heart. Thank you. Thank you. A really lovely interview. You very thoughtful and and you kept things focused on me. You, you, lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And yeah. that means a lot genuinely. Ah. And thank you to everybody watching at home. Be sure to share, subscribe, give this video a big thumbs up and leave lots of lovely comments. Be sure to check out Kate Bornstein's website as well by all of her books and audio books and all that good stuff and forthcoming graphic novels. And I'll see you all again soon for another episode of the Sarah O'Connell Show. Bye. Bye.